All right, well, let's take our Bibles. It's our final service on this series, uh, Lessons from Little Ones. And we're going to be looking at uh, Genesis chapter 41, verses 50 to 52. And this is uh, Life of Joseph, part two. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenna, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Well, Lord, we pray now as we look into your word that you would encourage us, you would strengthen us. We thank you for your faithfulness in Joseph's life. We thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. And we pray, O oh God, that you would move mightily in our hearts now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some of you listen to John MacArthur on the radio, and he once stated that early on in his pastoral ministry, he noticed an interesting fact. Nearly all the personal problems that drive people to seek pastoral counseling are related in some way to the issue of forgiveness. That's quite astounding, isn't it? that almost every single issue that needed pastoral counseling had to do with forgiveness or a lack of forgiveness within the heart of that individual. You know, if you live long enough on this planet called Earth, you encounter people. Uh, have you ever encountered people? You encounter people. And they're lovable, and yet they're fallible. Prone to selfishness and pride. Very much capable of hurting and betraying those closest to them. In fact, maybe you have even been hurt or betrayed by somebody close to you. How you choose to deal with an offense clearly will impact your daily relationships, your experiences, and even your reputation. Many times people choose to become bitter, or estranged, or disillusioned, or even defeated due to the offenses that they faced in life. And this morning as we look at Joseph, the question is, is there a better way to deal with these offenses and these disappointments that come to every single one of us? Today we'll look at the life of Joseph, who experienced betrayal by his very own flesh and blood. Joseph was the favorite son of his father, who gave him a coat of many colors. It wasn't just perceived favoritism, it was real. And Joseph was judged by a different standard than the rest of his brothers. And when his brothers saw that the father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word toward him. What kind of home was that? Can you imagine sitting at supper saying, pass the spuds? And they couldn't speak a kind word to Joseph? Maybe they were tempted to throw them at him? What was the tension of that home like? And, and what was it like for this young man to walk around? And then he wore this coat of many colors. And he wore it like he was royalty or something. Like he was intrinsically better than the rest. And maybe that's why Joseph's dream bugged them so much. Joseph had a dream. But when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Are you seeing this pattern? They hated him all the more. And he said to them, listen to the dream I had. We were buying up sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. And when your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it, and his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule over us? And they hated him all the more. This hatred that they have is becoming increasingly greater because of his dream and what he had said. Joseph was about 17 years old at this time. His 10 brothers arranged from being a few years older to maybe almost 10 years older. We're not told the ages. We can just kind of guess by how, where they were born in the birth order. They didn't seem to appreciate that the Lord was revealing these things to Joseph. No, when Joseph was sharing them, that just caused their, the ire within them to raise up. And one day they saw Joseph approaching to check up on them, of course, and report back to the father. 
He had given a negative report before. For Genesis 37, 2 says, He brought a bad report. Uh, sorry, he brought their father a bad report about them. And they basically just about had it with Joseph. Here comes the dreamer, they said to one another. Let's kill him and, and throw him into one of the cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. And then we'll see. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. So can you imagine now Joseph's horror? And she kind of waves and says, hi guys. And they jump him. And they beat him. And they strip him. They threaten him and throw him into a cistern. Thankfully, the brothers had second thoughts. And, but any illusions within Joseph's mind that they were just kidding, that they were just joking, were dashed when they pulled him out of that pit and sold him to the Midianites. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Certainly, if anyone has a right to hold a grudge, and the problem is when we hold that grudge, sometimes our lives unravel before our eyes. But if anyone had a right to hold a grudge and see his life unravel, it was Joseph. Yet when we review his life, apart from maybe this lack of wisdom in sharing his dream with his brothers, because we're not told the spirit in which he did it, but obviously they didn't receive it too kindly. Joseph is consistently portrayed as a man of faith, and a man of integrity, and anyone who meets him tends to respect him. And so what happened in Joseph's life? How could he experience such deep betrayal and be wronged so greatly and still be a man of integrity, a man of faith, a man who was respected? That's what we're going to look at this morning. The first thing is that he remained faithful. It says in Genesis 37, verse 36, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph into Egypt to Potiphar, and one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. It says, Meanwhile, because the brothers had gone back and told their father, Look what we found. We found this coat of many colors that was dipped in blood. Do you recognize it? And the, of course, Jacob said, Home, oh, it's Joseph. Maybe a ferocious animal devoured him. Meanwhile, while they're mourning his death, meanwhile, he is being sold into slavery to a man named Potiphar. The favorite child who could do no wrong was now property of a stranger who could do with him whatever he wanted. And yet, Joseph does not appear to be swallowed up by bitterness and, and resentment. And that oftentimes happens to us when we are wrong, when we are hurt. It's so easy to go there and to nurse the bitterness and to nurse the resentment. Joseph could have spent all his time feeling sorry for himself, determining that he was forever a victim of a horrible crime. And he was a victim of a horrible crime. And yet Joseph doesn't let those circumstances shape his identity. Instead, he seems to cling to the promise that he was destined for something. For God had given him those two dreams. The second dream, even the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to him. And he determined that he would be a servant of God. Herbert Lockyer says, you can't be defined by your failures any more than you can be defined by your successes. We are defined by our standing in Christ. And so Joseph understood that his relationship with God was a thing that shaped his destiny and shaped who he was and shaped all about him and shaped his definition of who he was. In fact, it was so much so that others recognized it. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in the eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything that he owned. Joseph is trusting God, and God seems to be faithful in Joseph's life. But the depth of his faith, of course, is seen in his response to Potiphar's wife and her invitation to have an affair. If Joseph would have harbored bitterness, if Joseph would have harbored anger, if Joseph would have harbored malice, he might have determined it was his right to break the rules. 
It was his right to just live for his own enjoyment. And he might have availed himself to Potiphar's wife's invitation. But instead he says to her, no one is greater in the house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except for you because you're his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Even in the midst of all his circumstance, he is concerned that he does not do what is wicked in the eyes of God. And though she spoke to him day after day, can you imagine? Every single day when, when she saw him, she would give him the invitation and he would have to repeat this every single day. No, I cannot do such a wicked thing. Day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Joseph did not let his circumstances define the kind of man that he was. Nor did he allow the behavior of others to determine his own behavior. Sometimes we can do that. Someone behaves badly, so that gives us permission to behave badly back. But not in Joseph's mind. Just because Potiphar's wife was behaving badly did not mean he could do something wicked before God. No, he was going to remain faithful to God regardless of whether anyone else in Potiphar's house remained faithful to God. Later, when Joseph is brought in before Pharaoh to interpret Pharaoh's dream, he affirms his relationship with God. He says to Pharaoh, I can't interpret your dream. I can't do it. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. He's understanding that it is God that does these things. And if you ever face an offense, if you are tempted to be defined by it, remember who you are in Jesus Christ. You are a son and daughter of the Most High God, and that fact should do more to shape your identity than anything else. And it will give you the grace, and it will give you the courage to move on. And it will give you the grace and the courage to rise above those things that have happened that are horrible. And this thing that happened to Joseph was indeed horrible. The second thing we see about Joseph is that he forgot. He was forgetful. Look what he says. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh. And said, it is because God made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. When we are wrong, it's really easy to become fixated upon the thing that we were wronged in. Is that not true? We're kind of like a dog looking at a squirrel. We're not going to look away. We are intent upon that squirrel and we are going to be fixated upon it. We vow never to be and never to forget. Once bitten, twice shot. But the problem is when our mind becomes consumed thinking about that person that has offended us and how horrible they really are. Especially if that person goes to church with us. During the worship service, we're thinking, there they are, sitting over there, a couple sections over. Oh yeah, look at them. They got their hands raised. You notice that? How, how can they be worshiping God? After all the things that they did to me, oh, they're probably just pretending. They're putting on a show. They're not a true worshiper like me. And I wonder, do we just kind of deceive ourselves? I'm not worshiping God in that moment. I'm fixated upon that person. I'm not even thinking about God. And I've lost the wonder of worship. <coughs> or if they're not there, you think, well, yeah. I know if they're not in church today. Huh. Probably couldn't get up. Probably lazy. Maybe they're on the verge of backsliding you know, after what they did to me. Boy, they're just not a spiritual me as I am. Look at me. I am here in church and I'm worshiping. Or am I? I'm not worshiping. I'm not worshiping God. I'm not even thinking about God. I'm thinking about this person that's offended me and wronged me. And so that's what happens to our hearts is we begin to be fixated upon those other individuals. And the more and more we replay the offense in our minds, the larger those people that offended us grow and appear in our imagination. Have you ever had one of those imaginary arguments? And you're having this argument with that person that's offended you and you're telling them off and they're telling you off and you, well I'm going to say this and, and they're going to say that and I'm going to say this. Have you ever had one of those? And so we, we do that and in the midst of it what do we end up losing? We lose our joy. We lose our joy. And we lose our opportunity to, 
to worship God because hatred for the offender begins to consume our thoughts and our hearts and our minds instead of the love of God and the faithfulness of God and the grace of God consuming our hearts and our minds. And you say, but I can't forget. How could I forget what they did to me? Don't you see this knife? It's still on my back. I wonder, when Joseph's brothers appeared to him, remember when he was kind of serving Pharaoh and the brothers came to buy food and they appeared? Do you think that Joseph recalled what they had done? When it says, I call my son Manasseh because God has made me for, to forget. Do you think that God gave Joseph divine amnesia? That he just somehow went, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. You, you're wrong? You sold me into slavery? What are you talking about? I don't know. I thought I was born in Pharaoh's household. But did he have amnesia? What does it mean to forget? Desmond Tutu says, forgiveness does not mean amnesia. Amnesia is most, a most dangerous thing, especially in a community, a nation, or international level. We must forgive, but we must always, or sorry, almost always, we should not forget that there were atrocities, because if we do, then like, they will likely to be repeated. Think about the Lord. Does he forget your sin? Once they are forgiven? Well, the Bible says that. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. So what does that mean? That God will remember my sin no more. Does that mean that if I ever repeat a sin and I go to the Lord, the Lord will say, I'm so shocked that you would ever do that. Who would have ever thought? Or will he say, you know what? This is the third time this week. I wonder what the Lord does. The all-knowing God, is he somehow unaware now because he has forgiven my sin? What does it mean to forget? What does it mean to forgive and to forget? Because for Joseph, he was able to forget and it really helped him overcome this horrible thing that was done to him. So how does forgetting help me and help you when something horrible is done to us? Well, how does God forget? Well, he chooses not to bring my sin up again. They're forgiven. He's not going to bring it up again and use it against me. It is cast there. It is placed behind his back. He just chooses. It's not that he has amnesia and forgets somehow. No, he chooses not to harbor on it. He chooses not to bring it up again. That's the way in which Joseph forgot. We can only wonder if the painful memory suddenly refers, resurfaced once he saw his brothers who unknowingly stood before him. I wonder when Joseph saw them, did he have a lump in his throat? Did his heart palpitate? You know what it's like. You forgive somebody and then you see them at Sears. And you kind of want to go the other way. But then they see you and wave. And you know you have to go over and talk to them, but all those feelings are down there, and, and you have to kind of remind yourself, okay, Lord, I've forgiven this person. Help me, oh God, right now by your grace to show grace to them. Now, as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Oh, I wonder how much he forgot. Where do you come from? Well, from the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. And Joseph's quietly counting. Reuben, Simeon, well, there's Levi, Judah, there's Zebulun, there's a car that's back there, boy, he's grown. Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, where's Benjamin? They haven't killed him too, have they? Have they sold Benjamin into slavery? What have they done with Benjamin? And I wonder if in his mind, his heart, he was doing that. And although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. And then he remembered his dream and said to them, you're spies. I wonder in that moment, did the Spirit of God remind him of that dream and say, just be careful now, Joseph. Be careful how you respond. Be careful how you act. Because at that moment, he possessed the power and even the temptation, perhaps, to order their execution. And nobody would have even questioned it. 
He could have done it. But God reminds him of the dream he had 30 years earlier. And says, be careful. They deny being spies. But they replied, your servants are 12 brothers. The sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. And the youngest. The youngest? The youngest is now with your, our father. And one is no more. Joseph wants to make sure Benjamin is okay. But he won't exact revenge. For God has made him to forget. It's not that he's not aware of what happened. But God has made him to forget that it's not his place now to exact revenge. He has forgotten. He will not bring this up against them and hold it against them. For he has forgiven them and he has forgotten. He chooses not to lift his sword against his brothers. But he still wants to make sure Benjamin is safe. If you're honest men, let one of you brothers stay here in the prison. While the rest of you take the grain back to your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me. So that your words may be verified and you may not die. Of course when they return, Jacob has a fit. Why did you mention Benjamin? Now look, Satan is there. And what's going on? And finally it was time to go back and buy more food. Well, Joseph has heard them. Talking, he hears something he didn't know before as he hears them talking because he understands their language even though they don't know that he understands because they don't recognize him. And he finds out that the brothers regretted their action. Don't you wish sometimes when people hurt you that you could actually be a fly on the wall and hear them say, oh, I so regret what I said about Pastor Ben. And they said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother we saw how distressed he was when he pleaded for us with, for his life. But we wouldn't listen. That's why all this distress has come upon us. And Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now he must give an accounting for his blood. But they did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. And Joseph realized something that moment, I think, that helped him. And while he forgot... And found peace years before when Manasseh was born. His brothers carried the weight of the crime for 30 years. And even now in this very moment it was haunting them. God made him to forget. And that helped him to forgive. Even when he understood the great guilt that the brothers carried. And what did Joseph do when he heard his brothers talking like this? The Bible says that he turned away from them and he began to weep. Why did he weep? He wept because he sensed the brother's pain. He was filled with empathy. He was filled with compassion. I tell you, when those people that have hurt you and wronged you, when you are able to have compassion for them, you are on the pathway not only to great forgiveness, but to reconciliation. He was beginning to feel something he hadn't felt for a long, long, long time. He was beginning to feel love. And although he had forgiven, he had to forgive in order to forget. He would not exact revenge upon his brothers. But he still needed to find out now whether or not he could have reconciliation with them. And of course, that's the beautiful part of the story. The last thing that we see, though, is he's also fruitful. The second son named to him was Ephraim, because God has made me fruitful in the land of my sufferings. He's not minimizing the fact that he is going through a time of suffering. He's not minimizing the fact that he's gone through a time of pain. This isn't some mind over matter thing where, oh no, you know, I, I, I don't have I don't have any suffering. No, he says, I have suffering, but God is faithful in the midst of it. And God has made me fruitful in the midst of it. Make no, no mistake about it, things have been tough for Joseph. He spent basically his 20s in prison. It hasn't been all that wonderful for him. He has suffered tremendously, but in the midst of it, he has found there to be a God that he served who was faithful and true. He was placed in charge of Potiphar's house. He was placed in charge of the prison where he was held. And now at age 30, he's a pretty young man. And he's placed in charge of the entire nation of Israel. It's interesting how God prepared him along the way. 
that Pharaoh's dream would have happened as soon as Joseph had arrived in Egypt. He would have been ill-equipped to handle the responsibility that would, was placed upon him to look after the nation. Romans 8, 28 says, And now we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Even though it wasn't written for many years later when Paul wrote this by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I wonder if Joseph intrinsically understood it. God made him fruitful. God set him off in the very place he needed to be to save his family. And so he finally reveals himself to his brothers. And Joseph says to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he says, I am Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Oh, he was supposed to have forgotten that part. No, he remembers. It's just not going to hold it against him. Watch the grace that is bestowed towards his brothers. And now, do not be distressed. and Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Talk about grace and talk about compassion. How on earth could he have such grace and compassion? Because he understood the fruitfulness of God. Joseph was not fruitful just because he's been promoted to second in command of all of Egypt. That's pretty awesome. No, I think he was fruitful. I think he was fruitful because he had discovered the compassion needed to forgive. I think he was fruitful because he understood the power of the Spirit to extend grace to those who he could have easily resented and hated. Remember Haman in the book of Esther? He too was second in command of all of Assyria, and yet his heart was unfruitful. His heart was unfruitful. Oh, on the outward things, he was fruitful. He was second in command, just like Joseph was. But in his heart, he was unfruitful. There was no grace in his heart. There was no love. There was no compassion. No, there was only hatred and malice for Mordecai and for the entire Jewish people, and he's going to wipe them off the face of the planet. He was invited to a private banquet with the king and queen, Queen Esther. And all the way home from this banquet, he encounters Mordecai one more time. Haman went out that day from that banquet high in his spirits. And when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he never rose, nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, calling together his friends, and Jairus, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth and his many sons and all the ways the king had honored him and how he elevated him above all the nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I am the only person that Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. She has invited me along with the king tomorrow too. Note verse 13. But all this gives me no satisfaction. As long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. And you could feel the rage and you could feel the anger and you could feel all these things. And all that he would say, I am fruitful, is meaningless because his heart was unfruitful. Joseph was fruitful. Not because of what he possessed. He was fruitful not because of his position. He was fruitful because his heart was full of grace and forgiveness for his brothers. Unfortunately, sometimes Christians sound just like Haman and less like Joseph. Because we harbor bitterness and unforgiveness. You know, we have the blessing of God in Jesus Christ. We have been forgiven of our sins. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we have a holy purpose for which God has called us to. And those things should drive us, propel us forward with a spirit of joy and, and with, with, with thanksgiving and with grace. But if we hold on to a past hurt and we never move on from it and we never heal from it, or worse, we, we drink the poison of unforgiveness. You know, the one that you drink and you hope the other person falls dead? 
but it actually kills you. Now, I don't want to minimize in any way the death of betrayal in your heart or in my heart or, or in any of our hearts. We don't want to minimize the death of betrayal in Joseph's heart. But we can't allow past hurts and past betrayals to define who we are. No, if we are Christians, then we are children of God. And we know the wonder of God's grace. And we know the wonder of God's forgiveness. And as those who have been forgiven, as those who have received His grace, who better on this planet to show grace to those who don't deserve it? Because if we're honest, we didn't deserve God's grace either. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. But it's not fair, Lord. Well, was it fair to forgive you? But it's hard, Lord. Well, was it easy for me to forgive you? He left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny. Right? On a lonely hill called Golgotha, where he laid down his life for me. That's what it cost him. It cost him leaving, spreading, becoming man, coming and bearing the atrocities of, of, of people lying about him and, and, and uh, disdaining him and hitting him and, and, and crucifying him so that I could be set free. So when I say, oh Lord, it costs too much, he can just say, well, you've been forgiven. Learn to forgive. C.S. Lewis says we all agree that forgiving is a beautiful idea until we have to practice it. And that's where it gets hard. It's hard sometimes to forgive. In her article on forgiveness and health, Charlotte Van Oden Witvin, I said that wrong. I'm sure she'll have to forgive me, especially after an article on forgiveness and health. But she says forgiveness is at the center of the gospel message and shapes the Christian's identity. And so that's what we want. We want a heart that Joseph had. A heart that is full of grace and forgiveness. Joseph seemed to learn this. And as a result, words like forgiveness and grace describe his nature. Far more than words like bitterness and strife. And I look at my life and I look at your life and I think, oh, on that day when it's our funeral day, what kind of words will describe me? When the grandkids are all sitting around, or the nieces and nephews, and they're talking, what was Uncle Dan like? Will words like bitterness and harshness, will those words describe me? Or will the words of forgiveness and grace? May they allow, the Lord allow those same words to describe your character and nature as well. So don't allow negative and painful experiences to define you. Remember, you're standing before the Lord. You are a child of God. You are a son and daughter of God. That should let you stand tall. Learn to forget. Don't hold on to past hurts. Choose to forgive and remember them no more. Will you ever truly forget them? No. You always you won't have amnesia. You just are choosing not to use them against those person and that person anymore. That's what that means. So it's not even that we neglect to, to deal with the issues either. Because sometimes in forgiveness, the best thing, the most loving thing is to deal with an issue. That's what Joseph had to do with his brothers to find if they could move on past forgiveness into reconciliation. And then allow God to make you fruitful. Fill your heart with love and joy and grace and peace. Oh, what a wonderful thing the peace of God is. Let your spirit be sweet. And as it is, then there will be a fruitfulness about you that others will recognize. So today, as we conclude this series and this message, are you struggling with unforgiveness? Are you struggling with hurt and betrayal? It does hurt to be betrayed. And it does take a, a little bit of a process, I know, and the healing process, but don't stay there. Say, oh Lord, help me. Help me like Joseph to overcome this in your grace and in your strength. Do you want freedom? 
from hatred and bitterness, then ask the Lord. Ask the Lord to help you begin the process of forgiveness. And it is a process, by the way. He can fill your heart with compassion. And He can allow you to be free. And that's what we want. We want to be free. Amen? Let's bow our heads and hearts. Lord Jesus, we come. We come to you, O Holy Spirit. And we ask, O Father, that you would do a mighty work in our lives. We realize, Lord, that there are times where we are hurt. And there's times where we are disappointed. And there's times that we misunderstand one another. Sometimes we wrong each other. Most of the time, we probably didn't intend to, but we did. And in those moments, Lord, when we are the one that's hurt, we pray, Father, we will humble ourselves enough to say that we are sorry. And we will begin a process of reconciliation. But Lord, if we are the ones that have been hurt, if we are the ones that have been wronged, oh Lord, we pray, first of all, that there would be a healing balm that would come. And just allow the wound not to fester, but Lord, to be healed. And we understand, oh Lord, that this aspect of grace and forgiveness, as difficult as it is, Lord, you can help us. Let us be faithful to you first of all. And then, Lord, let us begin that process of forgiveness. And as we do, you will make us fruitful and hard in life. And so, Lord, let that be ours, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.